Good evening, welcome to HealthQuest. I'm Deborah Arneson, your host for the evening, and we have a great show for all of our viewing audience this evening. We have once again, one of my dearest guests, Aaron Bartz, who is just a wealth of knowledge, and he's here to share with us information on your cardio health and the health of your heart. So we're gonna talk tonight about all kinds of things that have to do with cholesterol and the number one killer in America, which is heart <laughs> disease, still unfortunately to this day. So Aaron, thanks for being with thank us. Thank you for inviting me. It's great me. to have you Good back. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I know, you're squeezing me in all your <laughs> travels here, and he's out there just sharing this information of wealth with so many different people around the country, educating, educating, educating. Yes. So we're thrilled to have you. Thanks. So let's talk about cardiovascular health. Tell me something, what role does cholesterol serve in the body and is all cholesterol bad? Um, no, all cholesterol is not bad. Actually, uh, cholesterol plays uh, a role in many positive things. It uh, helps produce sex hormones. It helps produce bile acids, which actually help with your digestion. Uh, so there's many positive things that cholesterol does. Um, cholesterol, what we're worried about from a negative point of view is when uh, serum cholesterol or cholesterol in the blood uh, becomes elevated, that can lead to atherosclerosis and uh, other um, you know, potentially heart disease, mm -hmm. and that's what we get concerned about from a negative point of view with cholesterol. So basically what cholesterol will do is create a negative plaque that ends up kind of accruing or building up along the walls of the arteries exactly. and veins, and then, we are, then we're in trouble. Right. So we need some, because all, you know, most people that walk into my office are like, oh, my cholesterol's elevated, and I'm like, well, it's not that elevated, right. and it's not that bad, so, and they're like, no, 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 it's 190, right. I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> right, and actually, it, really, a cholesterol, 80% uh, of your cholesterol is produced by your liver anyway right. so you know 20 percent you can really control through diet and and those factors so um, you're right it's not um, it's not as bad as people you know every time people hear cholesterol they think negative it's, right. it's not really that right. way so this is just a sidebar real quick and I know mm -hmm. you hate it when I do that but sure. I'm going to do it but uh -huh. I mean in my opinion and I'm wondering about yours as well I mean, most people really have elevated cholesterol levels because they eat so imbalanced. Right. I mean, our diets are so low in fiber. They're horribly low in fatty acids, healthy fatty acids specifically, exactly. right? Exactly. Right, yeah, that's exactly why we see high cholesterol. Yeah, because yep. I see people when they take healthy oils and fiber, it drops 30, 40 points that's right. like that. That's, that's right. right. Yep. That's an easy fix. <laughs> that's right. So people need to do that. Okay, so do you think cholesterol, the measurement of your cholesterol is the best way to determine your risk for heart disease? The measurement problems? of cholesterol, yeah, the measurement of cholesterol would be one of the ways to uh, predict possible heart disease and, and cardiovascular problems. But cholesterol alone would not be the only way uh, to do that. Um, what I mean by that is there are there's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And so just going to your doctor and getting your cholesterol measurement like you mentioned, somebody comes in the office and says, my cholesterol's, you know, 250. Well, mm -hmm. that does not really tell you a lot. Actually, I was, I was talking to a nutritionist down in uh, Indianapolis last week, and she was actually doing a conference uh, to uh, medical physicians, and she was saying, I can't believe how many people still come into our office and say, I had my cholesterol checked, and they show her a lab report that just has total cholesterol. Right. She said that really doesn't tell her anything. Right. Um, you really need to have uh, your good cholesterol and bad cholesterol levels. Your good cholesterol is referred to as HDLs, high density, or high density lipoproteins, mm -hmm. and then your bad cholesterol is your LDLs, your low density uh, lipoproteins. And the ratio of those two um, forms of cholesterol is a good indicator of your um, potential risk for cardiovascular right. problems. And Do you also take triglycerides into account? Yeah, we look okay. at triglycerides also in that panel. Okay. Um, so it's not just looking at your total cholesterol, but also really looking all at your the, lipids. Yeah, all your lipids and seeing the ratios that those fall into. Right, and the, and the problem I think tends to, for most people tends to be that we've got three potential hazardous right. lipids or fatty acids against one, one good. good. One. <laughs> so the ratio should be high. And the one thing that, or the couple things that drive the HDLs up are exercise, which most people don't, don't feel, feel like doing, <laughs> you know, and then of course the good fatty acids and vitamin C, right? right. Right. Yeah, so, okay, so what should the ratio be of the good guys to the bad guys? Yeah, your ratio of total cholesterol to HDLs, your good cholesterol, mm -hmm. should be about uh, four to one. Okay. Your ratio of 
LDLs, your bad cholesterol, to HDLs should be about 2.5 to 1. Okay. And so those are the ratios when you're looking at, um, you know, is this person in range? We would look at those ratios rather than just saying, wow, your cholesterol is 250, you better get on, you know, uh, this, this drug. And do most labs do those ratios for you? Yeah, most labs offer those and really uh, I, if you're going to get a lab done, um, it's okay. really, I mean, you really should get that done. Don't just get your total cholesterol done. Can you, let's have everyone get out a pencil and paper, and you could repeat that again if you would, Aaron. Yeah, you want to look at, rather than just total cholesterol, you want to look at what are your HDLs, what are your LDLs, and then what are your triglycerides. Okay. And if you can get those, that will give you an indication of, you know, whether you need to look at something to lower your cholesterol, or if your cholesterol is a little high, but those ratios are proper, mm -hmm. then, it's okay. then you're okay. But you mentioned 2.5 to 1 for yeah, the good your, your to total guy. cholesterol to HDL, which is your good cholesterol, should be 4 to 1. And then your, your LDLs, which is your bad cholesterol, to your HDL should be 2.5 to 1. Great. And actually, here's, here's something interesting. If you get a 1% drop in your LDLs, your risk for heart attack goes down 2%. If, you're, if you get a 1% increase in your HDLs, your risk of heart attack goes down 3 to 4%. So by yeah. altering those HDL, LDL numbers, you can really... Um, you can affect whether sure. you're going to have heart disease or stroke. And actually, like yeah. you mentioned in the beginning, heart disease is the number one killer in America, and stroke is number three, uh, cancer being number two. So two yeah. out of your top three is uh, cardiovascular. That's, so that's amazing. Yeah, and it's almost yeah. a million people a year, 700,000 uh, through heart disease and 160,000 uh, through stroke. It's not a pretty picture. No. <laughs> so we better like do something to prevent this. Right. So that's a good question. What's the best way to lower cholesterol levels? Best way to lower cholesterol actually is through dietary changes like you had mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. We would recommend that they cut down their animal protein and uh, cholesterol intake through those foods and actually increase their fiber foods through vegetables mm -hmm. and and um, grains and um, you know fruits and things yeah. like that. Um, that's the best way from a lifestyle point of view. Increasing exercise, which you know we don't like to do, but really it's beneficial. Uh, stopping smoking, uh, losing weight, all those things have are, are factors. Now you know, Aaron, people are going to be sitting out there <laughs> looking at this, and they're going to change the doc. Right. We're going, okay, exercise, lose weight, eat more fiber. People are like, oh. yeah. all the things you know, they don't want to do. But you know what? It's like even if you start with one simple thing. That's right. You know, and oftentimes, how many people do you meet that never drink water? Yep, that's right. Which means we recycle our fat. Basically, yep. it just gets you know redistributed, or we just pack it in even better because we have no medium by which to push nutrients in and out of the cells with. That's so, right. drinking water and eating fiber. You know, I tell people start with a piece of fruit a day or a cup of vegetables a day if you eat none. Yep. It's a big if you deal. Take, if you take one of those suggestions, do it for 21 days, and then it becomes a habit, and then you, you take another, another one, right. and eventually, you know, if you try to do all, if you go from one extreme to the other extreme, chances are you're not going to be able to maintain that. But if you take one idea, do it for a few weeks, and then add another idea. That's a really good suggestion. Yeah. Otherwise, people are just like it's deer, over, it's a deer in headlights. Yeah. Yeah. It's too overwhelming. Anything. You might be able to do it for a couple of days yeah. and then you're, you know, forget this. Well, it's so interesting because as a clinical nutritionist, you know, it's it, you start in one place and you come to another, but it's like you really can't be all or nothing either because that's not life, you know. Right. But really, honestly, if you look at the fact that we all eat at least 21 meals a week mm. and if 18 out of the 21 were mindful right. about doing things somewhat diligently right. for our bodies, you're never going to age, you know, yeah. and you're not going to be one of those statistics yeah. where we're, you know, the heart disease category, the stroke category, the cancer category. Yeah. You can afford three uh, fun... Misdemeanors. <laughs> right. Misdemeanors every week. <laughs> yeah, and we should because that's what life is about. Right. Um, so tell us this. What role does fat consumption have in cardiovascular health? A lot of... Uh, fat is interesting subject because over the last 15 years, you'll see a lot of uh, no-fat, low-fat foods that people have gone right, to. Right. And basically for weight loss or you know to maintain weight and if you look in general our society has not become a thinner society it's oh, become bigger. Uh, yeah bigger and it's really it's not so much the fats but what type of fats do you get mm -hmm. uh, there are essential fatty acids that are necessary for proper health and about a, over the last hundred years if you look at the American diet there's been a big transition because of the way we've gone from the local fa uh, family farm 
to the grocery stores, the right. supermarkets, processed. and yeah, processed foods. And that that invention of the the supermarket has led to a need for shelf life. And mm -hmm. so the foods are processed so that they can so you can have maximum shelf life. And one of the things that is against shelf life is essential fatty acids because they go rancid. Right. So what's happened over the last hundred years is we've gone to uh, these uh, refined vegetable oils that you find in many foods. For mm -hmm. example, 96% of the vegetable oils that are found in our foods today come from corn, soybean, cottonseed, and canola oil. All of those oils are high in omega-6 and very low in omega-3. Omega-3 is an essential fatty acid that is necessary for proper cardiovascular right. function. Right. And so it, it's just part of our um, culture, the way we um, d distribute the food well, plus, that's led to that. If I can say something, Aaron, and this is really important information because I, I love oils. I'm pas passionate about mm -hmm. them. Having studied in India and, and Ayurveda uses oil and all the different you know modalities for healing. But the oils in America are processed in a very specific way, sure. and they're highly, highly refined. Yep. And when an oil becomes highly refined, A, it becomes more stable, yep. B, it becomes less bioavailable to the body. Sure. And oftentimes, some of the refining components or chemicals are things like hexane, yep. which are very degrading for the cell membrane, right? Toxic, yeah. They're horrible yep. for the body. So we're consuming these highly refined, long shelf life oils that are killing us. Yep. And did you read um, lately, I don't remember what journal it was, I want to say it was the Journal of, um, I don't know, of, of Integrative Health or something, or, or Preventive Health, but they talked about this gooey, sticky plaque that they're finding in young men primarily, okay. who are in their 30s and 40s, no symptomatology of cardiovascular problems, cut them open, do an autopsy, and they're finding this gooey, sticky plaque that when they pull, they cut through it, it when they serrate it, uh -huh. it actually pulls back together again. Wow, and their, their hypothesis is that this new type of plaque that's found around the heart muscle and the chambers is um, a byproduct of trans fatty acids. Okay. Yep. And trans fatty acids are these highly refined, that's oxygenated, right. horrible oils yep. that are all over the place in our, our highly processed foods. That's why margarine, uh, for example, right. is not uh, right. you know not beneficial. We should really eat butter. No, yeah, uh, you're better off yeah, with butter. That's right. And uh, body knows what to do with it. Right. <laughs> that's right. And those are the oxidized oils that your body does not really know what to do and that end up leading to the the placking and the hardening of the arteries. Right. And so that's really even if you look at agricultural practices, free range chicken eggs have a ratio of three to one omega six to omega three, the good uh, the, the well, stuff you need for the heart. But the corn fed chicken eggs, USDA corn fed chicken eggs that we mm -hmm. get right now, nineteen to one. So you go from three to one free-range chicken eggs to 19 to 1. So not only has shelf life and that, that wow. factor played a role, but also the way we do agriculture. Um, so it's just, it, there's been a transition over the last uh, 100 years. If you looked 100 years ago at the average American diet, it was a 3 to 1 ratio of omega-6 to mm -hmm. omega-3. Now it's average 19 to 1. So a, a big transition. Well, beyond that, how many people are allergic to corn? Right, right. It's yep. a very popular sensitivity, yep. you know, right. high sensitivity food yep. or allergen. Yeah, so. it's one of the high, top five. Yeah. We're top five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it they is. hit parade, yes. <laughs> okay, so tell us about the cardiovascular effects of the omega-3 fatty acids and where do they come from? Okay, your omega-3s come a lot from uh, fish. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I, I saw on the nightly news a couple of weeks ago that they, the American Heart Association came out and recommended that people with um, cardiovascular disease in their family or a family history of cardio, cardiovascular event uh, start eating fish twice a week and really what they're recommending there is to do that because you get your omega-3s through your fish. Uh, Omega-3s have, um, they prevent atherosclerosis, mm -hmm. they actually have an anti-thrombotic effect, anti-inflammatory effect, so even patients with chronic disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. uh, any pain disorder would, re would benefit from eating uh, more fish in their diet, getting the omega Omega threes. Um, they right. actually also the omega threes have been shown to reduce your LDLs, your bad cholesterol, and they've been shown to increase your HDLs, lower your triglycerides. So, eating more fish, getting more fish in the diet will improve your cardiovascular mm. um, health. 
That's great. So more fish, but cold Carfish. water fish. Right, exactly. Right? Cold water fish. Yep. Not the mahi mahi right. or the uh, <laughs> lake trout or the stuff that comes out of Lake Michigan. That's right. right. That's right. So it has to be the stuff that swims deep in the ocean. Yes. Okay. So how can one increase the amount of omega threes other than eating the fish? Could they take in capsulates? Yeah, f fish is the would be the best way just through the diet. And if you look at Greenland Eskimos, Greenland Eskimos have a, a diet high in fat, but they have very low cardiovascular um, problems in mm. their in their uh, culture and that's that's actually become something that um, people have been interested in because right. they're eating diets high in fat but they have very low cardiovascular event and that seems to be um, contraindicated